Good, good, uh, good day. Today is September the 29th. Uh, and today we are going, we need to get some points. We need to uh, uh, continue to buck up your uh, grade point average for this unit, and you will need them. And so we're going to be scripting uh, this uh, Rick Steves video about Greece, which is, before we continue on, uh, Rick Steve is going to take us to Greece, and we're going to look at what it looks like now. And he'll talk a lot about Greek culture uh, and those kind of things. And uh, I, I just find Rick Steve's enjoyable, and I hope you do as well. And so, if you'll let me pull this up, get ready to go with Rick. And that's exactly why we're here. It's Athens. Thanks for joining us. You heard it. It's Athens. Thanks for joining us. You know, I'm telling you, there is nothing like travel. It's one of the things that I miss the most about this uh, pandemic world. Today we're in Athens and side trips. About five centuries before Christ, Athens was the center of the Western world. At a time when Rome was just a village, it was here that the foundations of our Western civilization were laid. And today... See, so at the very beginning of what I started talking about. Why do we study Greece and Athens? It's what he says. The foundations of Western civilization were laid. In the midst of all this rich heritage, the vibrant capital of Greece still thrives. We'll enjoy the magnificent. Okay, let's have a look at this. This is uh, the Parthenon. And if you want to find the Parthenon closest to us, you simply go to Nashville, Tennessee. They reconstructed a Parthenon in Nashville. The Parthenon had a statue to the patron or goddess of Athens, Athena, the goddess of wisdom. By the way, these are columns. And if you look closely, you know, you say, well, how did they get those things up there? Well, it's kind of like uh, Legos or building blocks. See these uh, joints in here? What they would do is, and these are all pieces of limestone, they would carve them out in the desirable shape, and then uh, and they would have little fittings where you had a, you know, a inside and an outside fitting that would go like this, and that the weight of them kept them rigid. This is what is called post and lintel construction. We study a lot uh, about architecture uh, in here. Post and lintel. Uh, anytime you see a structure like this, it's post and lintel. And by the way, these you look at this, these grooves in here, and this is on your test, these grooves are called flutes. Why are they named that? I couldn't tell you. And he's also going to talk to you about the top, whether these columns are Corinthian or Dorian, and he'll explain the difference of that in just a second. Since of ancient Athens, marvel at the wonders of the Acropolis. Savor some tasty Greek street food. Yeah. And check out the It's a hero. G Y R O. Hero. Normally it has lamb, meat, uh, and then some spices. You know, if you ever go by a place where they have this big. Sh like this big piece of meat, and it's slowly turning, and there's a guy there shaving. That's that's what you're eating. Yeah. Bring your collection of ancient Greek art. Then we'll poke around the paca before escaping the big city to consult an ancient oracle and relax. You heard what he said, and they consult the oracle. And by the way, now here is a Greek theater. Remember the Greeks created public theater. And a, Rick Steve's going to show you that, I mean, the Greeks were so intelligent. Rick Steve will be able to stand down here. And remember, they didn't have any amplification. And he will be able to speak. And the people here and up here will be able to hear what he says. Not a classic Greek island. In the extreme south of Europe is Greece. Its capital is Athens. From there, we side trip to the Oracle of Delphi, then cruise from Athens' port of Piraeus. To the island of Ephra. Now, by the way, we're going to be studying a lot about uh, ancient Athens, but also Sparta. Sparta was over here. 
Uh, yeah, and this is the Peloponnese. Um, P-E-L-O-P-P-O-N-I-E-S-E, -E -E, Peloponnese. It is the peninsula here. They actually have dug a channel here so that ships can go through. Well, start up there at the historic, cultural, and literal high point of any trip to Athens, the Acropolis. Like other hilltop sites in the ancient Greek world, Athens Acropolis, or High City, was both a place of worship and a refuge when under attack. Crowned by the mighty Parthenon Temple, the Acropolis rises above modern Athens, a lasting testament to Greece's glorious golden age in the 5th century BC. Grand processions followed the Pan-Athenaic Way, which was a ceremonial path connecting the town below and the Acropolis. They passed through this imposing entryway and up to the religious heart of the city and the Parthenon. In the Parthenon is a statue of Athena, it's like 50 feet tall, maybe 30 feet tall. Yeah, maybe 30 feet tall, and I think it was made of silver, or at least plated in gold. Yeah, it was a precious stone. The Parthenon was perhaps the finest temple in the ancient world. Diantly battling the acidic air of our modern world, it still stands with the help of ongoing restoration work. It was constructed in the 5th century B.C., and dedicated to the virgin goddess Athena. See? Seeing it today is awe inspiring, but imagine how striking it must have looked when it was completed nearly 2,500 years ago in all its carved and brilliantly painted splendor. Yeah, see, now that's a thing. This would be a question on your test. See, that's a thing. Most people, including the founding fathers in Washington, D.C., pay attention, the founding fathers in Washington, D.C., when they wanted to create Washington, D.C. or all the other state capitals, they said, hey, let's make our cities, our capital buildings, look like ancient Greece and Rome. And they said, of course, since the ancient Greeks and Romans, their cities were white, then ours will be white. Well, see, that was wrong. The Greeks, as you just heard Rick Steve say, the Greeks loved gaudy color. And this thing was painted all kind of colors. They know because... You can still find traces of it. But then again, if you set for 2,500 years in the Mediterranean sun, it'll bleach the color out of anything and turn it bone white or whatever. And yeah, that's why the color can drop. The problem is, though, or the situation was that when the founding fathers who established Washington, D.C. in the years the 18th century said, oh, we're going to build it like Athens. Well, Athens is white. Well, Athens wasn't white. The adjacent Arechtheon is famous for its porch of the Caryatids, six beautiful maidens functioning as columns. Dedicated to Athena and Poseidon, this was one of the most important religious buildings. Of course, now you already know who Athena and Poseidon are. Athena, the goddess of wisdom. And actually, in uh, if you go to uh, Union Terminal in Cincinnati, it has the facade of Athena on the front of the terminal. Only in uh, Union Terminal, she represents not only the goddess of wisdom, but the goddess of commerce, of business. Yeah, smart business. And of course, Poseidon is the goddess, god of the oceans. Things on the Acropolis. This, rather than the Parthenon, was the culmination of the Pan-Athenaic procession. At the foot of the Acropolis, the ancient Agora, or marketplace, sprawls out from its surviving temple. This is where, for 3,000 years, Athenians gathered. Do you know they call it the Agora, a wide open space? Does anyone know what agoraphobia is? Agoraphobia, phobia means fear. Agoraphobia is the fear of wide open spaces. So many of our technical terms like that in medicine and science come from the Greeks. I mean, they really do. Agoraphobia. Arachnophobia. Fear of spiders. Hortonphobia. Who knows? While the Acropolis was the center of ritual and ceremony, the Agora was the beating heart of ancient Athens. For some 800 years, starting in the 6th century BC, this was the hub of commercial, political, and social life. Visitors wander the remains of what was the city's principal shopping mall and administrative center. Exploring the Agora 
It's fascinating to ponder the world of Plato and Aristotle and the age which made the foundations for Western thinking about economics, democracy. I'm going to give us just a little more volume, if you'll excuse me for a moment. How about right there? Yes. Come back, Steve. See, logic and more. The stoa of Attilus from the second century BC was rebuilt in modern times to house the Agora's museum. With so little of the Agora still standing, this reconstruction makes it easier to imagine the site in its original glory. It really was. It was kind of like the Agora was kind of like a wide open shopping mall. Crowds would gather in shady porticos like this to shop, socialize, or listen to the great philosophers of the age. In fact, Socrates spent much of his life right here, preaching the virtues of nothing in excess and urging those around him to. You heard him mention Socrates? Yeah. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. To know thyself. The Temple of Hephaestus, one of the best preserved and most typical of all Greek temples, dates from about 400 BC. Like the Parthenon, it's constructed in the simple Doric style. It housed big bronze statues of Hephaestus, the blacksmith god, and Athena, patroness of the city. Greek architecture evolved in stages. The capitals, or tops of the columns, were both functional and decorative. While just the tip of the architectural iceberg, these are handy indicators helping us identify the three main architectural orders or styles. <laughs> It is amazing how, though, I mean, look, this, these are just large pieces of stone. How did these people haul these large pieces of stone up such an incredible height? Yeah. The earliest style, Doric, has flat practical plates as capitals. This is the Doric. This is, these are Corinthian. The flat one was the Doric. This is Corinthian. Uh, the C is the tip-off. In the next order, Ionic. The capitals are decorated with understated Ionic, I'm sorry. scrolls. The final order, Corinthian, yeah, there popular is. later on with the Romans, features leafy capitals, boldly decorative, with no apologies necessary. How to remember all these? As the orders evolved, they gained syllables. Doric, Ionic, Corinthian. Hmm. But for most travelers, the Agora is more than an architectural review. Strolling in the footsteps of Socrates is your best opportunity to commune with the epic Greek past. Like so many great civilizations, ancient Greece peaked and then faded. 200 years ago, Athens was just a small town surrounded by big ruins sitting on lots of history. That 19th century Athens is today's Plaka. The Plaka district provides tourists with a more intimate Athens. No chaotic traffic, lots of colorful restaurants, and best souvenir shopping in all of Greece. And for a quick, inexpensive bite to eat, drop by a corner Euro and Suplaki stand. Euro means turning, referring to the slowly spinning round of meat, roasted yeah, pork or it. chicken, shaped as needed. And souplaki is meat on a skewer, shish kebab style. My favorite, a euro pita. Slice up that meat. Toss in a little salad. Satsiki, a garlic yogurt sauce, and spices. All wrapped in a handy cone of toasted pita bread. <laughs> Energized by a tasty euro, hike to the top of the plaka and explore the charming village of Anathiotika, literally Little Anathi. It was built in the 19th century. Now you'll notice so many of these Greek modern houses, they are surrounded by as much white as possible. And the Greeks learned that that was one way of deflecting the heat of the sun. It's a bit blinding, but yeah by people from the tiny Cycladic island of Anathi. They came here to the big city looking for work. In this oasis of tranquility nestled beneath the walls of the Acropolis, 
the intensity of Athens seems miles away. So yeah, Each wide narrow paths lined with flowers and dotted with cats dozing in the sunshine. Observe the peaceful rhythm See? of daily life. And with a little luck, you can make a friend and be invited in. Oh, and Or, in this case, up onto the roof. It or helps to have cameras following you around. Strong Greek coffee. <laughs> Athens is getting more and more people friendly. This elegant walkway is a popular pedestrian boulevard arcing around the back of the Acropolis. As the sun goes down, it's busy with locals and visitors alike. At the end of the walk, prime Acropolis View Real Estate is dedicated to the fine art of cafe sitting. Sipping a drink here puts you right in the middle of a lively green scene. Pardon the interruption. Andrew W. D. In Athens, it seems all roads pass through Syntagma Square. Today, people pour out of the city's busiest subway station into this cafe-built square. Shady trees make it a breezy and restful spot. 200 years ago, Athens was just a humble town of about 8,000 huddled at the base of the Acropolis. But when the Greeks won their independence from the Ottoman Turks in the early 1800s, they chose little but historic Athens to be their capital. This stately square is part of a grand project designed to turn the town into a suitable capital for the new nation. The original square was essentially a big front yard for the new royal palace. The country's leading families built mansions here to be close to the king. These mansions survive today as grand old hotels, embassies, and museums. I'm letting this go because you know, in 1843, has nothing to do with ancient Athens. Or constitution. The king gave a speech from this balcony granting his people, whose ancestors invented the concept, democracy. This place has been known as Constitution Square or Syntagma Square ever since. Today, the royal palace houses the Greek parliament. The palace and the tomb the of the unknown warrior are guarded by the much photographed head zones. These flamboyant soldiers with their distinctive strut change at the top of each hour. They're clad in the traditional pleated kilt and pom-pom shoes made famous by the Ebzo. These mountain fighters battled ferociously in Greece's early 19th century war of independence. They claim the soldiers' outfits have 400 cleats, one for each miserable year of Turkish occupation. And don't you forget it. Buoyant after winning freedom from its Turkish overlords, the new capital city flourished. Some of those first government buildings, built in the prevailing neoclassical style, still survive today. We'll get around to neoclassical. They stand amid today's bustling metropolis. In oh, I might as well mention it now. Neoclassical means new classical. And it refers to the way Washington, D.C. Uh, is decorated. See, these columns, Washington, D.C., the architecture is called neoclassical, new classical. It's a recreation of ancient Greece and Rome. And he uses the term, you know, in the 20th century, with an influx of refugees and industrialization luring workers in from the countryside, the population of Athens exploded. The flow of people into the sprawling city continues, and four million people, roughly one out of every three Greeks, call Athens home. And recently, the city has curbed pollution, cleaned up and pedestrianized the streets, spiffed up the museums, and invested in one of Europe's better public transit systems. But the country is going broke. Uh, yeah, that's one of the things. Greece is broke. It's having to really depend upon, uh, ask money from the European bank, and more and more of the European banks like, we ain't giving it to you. Descend into Athens' sleek and cool underground, and you'll enjoy a transit system as efficient as anything in Europe. With all its traffic congestion above and nearly a million Athenians zipping smoothly underground every day, the system is a godsend. Aramon Street, leading away from Syntagma, is a thriving pedestrian mall. Just a few years ago, this street was a car-clogged mess. Once again, when it was first pedestrianized, merchants were upset. Now, it's a hit with everyone.
The one must see site of the tourist zone is the National Archaeological Museum. This extraordinary collection lets you follow the sweep of Greek art history from 7,000 BC to 380. A trove of funerary art from the royal tombs of Mycenae shows treasures from a society that thrived around a thousand years before the days. Right, Mycenae predated Greece, and this is gold that you're looking at here. Of Socrates and Plato. You'll see finely decorated weapons and sheaths. Exquisite golden jewelry mm. and the delicate Papio gold cups. Reminders of the sophistication of that 15th century BC civilization. This warrior face from the 12th century BC shows women gathered to wave goodbye to a group of warriors heading off to war, sporting fancy armor with duffel bags hanging from their spears. These Mycenaean soldiers with their yellow ribbon moms are a timeless off-to-war scene repeated every generation in the 3,000 years since. Ancient Greeks celebrate... All right, now this is a something you will need going for the test. This is the traditional Greek statue of the adult male. It is called the Kouros, K-O-U-R-O-S. It will be on your test. The Kouros, K-O-U-R-O-S. Yes, and I'm sure Rick is about to say something about it. This guy too, by the way. The human body. To them, it was the embodiment of the order found in nature. All the parts were there in geometrical, if not biological, perfection. No individual features. Everything was idealized. In fact, these archaic statues were named simply Kouros, meaning See? boy, or Kora, meaning girl. See? Statues from this age, around 600 BC, all had the same standard features. Weight spread evenly on two feet, arms rigid at the side, Stiff braided hair, almond shaped eyes, high eyebrows, and the same quirky little grins. Archaic statues all look like cousins. During the archaic period, all the parts were there, but if they decided to walk, it would walk like a monster, stiffly, with no understanding of the subtle interplay between hips and shoulders. But Greek art evolved with its society. The 80 year period from about 480 to 400 BC was known as the golden age of Greece, the age of Socrates and Pericles, and Athens was the center. During this time, the golden mean was nothing in excess. In both life and art, everything was to be in balance. Golden age sculptors shifted weight more believably, placing their statues in a contrapposto pose. That means relaxed, with hips shifted realistically and weight resting on one foot. Statues looked more lifelike. Ancient Greek treasures include the Poseidon of Artemisia. This stunning bronze statue, cast in 460 BC, depicts the mighty god of the sea about to hurl its trident. Once again, we see that classic Greek balance between stillness and motion. But in around 330 BC, Athens was conquered by the Macedonians from the north. Subjugation by the Macedonians under Philip II and his son Alexander the Great Alexander ushered Great. in what's known as the Hellenistic period. See, that's what Hellenic period is the city, Greek city-states. The Hellenistic period is the period of Alexander the Great and his successors. So yes, Hellenic, Hellenistic on your test. The word Hellenistic refers to Greek culture after its political conquest. Greek Hellenistic art, like Greek Hellenistic society in general, evolved beyond the aesthetics of the Golden Age. While less balanced and composed, it was a more individualistic age with more exuberant and emotional art. The horse and jockey of Artemisian, cast in the second century BC, is filled with this Hellenistic energy. The high spirited detail is astonishing, right down to the horse's dramatic head and the concerned look on the young jockey's face. The evolution of Greek art from stiff to realistic to emotional would be echoed by Europe 2,000 years later, from stiff Gothic 
to realistic renaissance to emotional baroque. A two-hour drive northwest of Athens takes us to Delphi, one of the most important sites in the ancient world. Wherever you travel, seeing the precious artifacts in the big city museums first helps you better appreciate the historic sites out in the countryside. Ancient Delphi, perched high on the slopes of Mount Parnassos, was not a city. It was the site of the Oracle of Apollo, God of the Sun. People would Oracle, a way of telling the future, having questions answered. The Oracle of Apollo. Journey here from all over the known world to seek wisdom from the gods on vital affairs of state. Today, tourists zigzag up the ancient sacred way to the Temple of Apollo. The path is flanked by the remains of Delphi's famous treasuries, monuments erected by city-states in gratitude for the Oracle's advice. Local guides like Penny Volum Kotsu bring these ancient and mythic events to life. So tell me why this place was chosen for the Oracle. Zeus wanted to know where the center of the world was. He let two eagles fly from the two opposite ends of the universe, and this is where they met here in Delphi. So we call this basically the the Delphi Garden of the World. Yeah, the old Phalos. Yeah, this wonderful place became the center of the world. The resulting sanctuary of Apollo reached the height of its power between the sixth and the fourth centuries BC. The oracle became so influential that no great leader would make a major decision without first sending emissaries to consult. Like if you ever watched that terrible, terrible movie, The Three Hundred. Uh, Leonidas, the king of Sparta, goes and consults the oracle and has to pay him money. The oracle. There was a priestess inside the temple. Right underneath it, there was this room where she was inhaling vapors evaporating from the ground. So she was in trance. So she would babble and the priests would say, this is wisdom from the gods. Exactly. Because the priests debriefed those seeking advice on the state of their homelands, Delphi became the database of the ancient world. Because of that, the priests here were actually able to astound those who came with their wise, believably divine advice. And there was more to Delphi than just the oracle. So people from all over the Greek <laughs> world came here. Correct. And apart from coming here to consult the oracle, the other reason was also because, like in Olympia, they had the Olympic Games. Here in Delphi, we had the Pythian Games. Okay. Yeah, these were competitions concerning music, poetry, sport events as well. So, um, a balance of things music and sport. Yeah, everything in moderation. No prices. The golden mean and everything. So, we've got the theater, we've got the stadium. During those Pan Hellenic or all Greek festivals, Delphi See, this is a Greek theater. I mean, and once again, the Greeks had worked out the acoustics so well. I mean, the Greeks were just so intelligent. He filled its theater, which seated 5,000, and it packed as many as 7,000 sports fans into its stadium. I like being here at the end of the day, with the tourists gone, cheers of the long gone crowd still ringing in the cool mountain air, and the starting block. Oh what a hell. As it was in ancient times, Piraeus is still the port of Athens. From Piraeus, boats depart for points throughout the Aegean Sea. Cruise ships await their passengers, and hydrofoils vie with lumbering cart ferries. It's an exciting springboard for the Greek Isles. We're riding a flying dolphin one of the fleet of speedy hydrofoils that sits from Athens to the islands and from island to island. It's fast, but less scenic as the passengers are stuck inside. I like to hang out in the windy doorway. After a 90 minute ride, Athens is a world away. We pull into the Isle of Hydra. Hydra, the Hydra, yeah? The many headed, one of the Titans, the many headed snake. main town, also called Hydra, is home to about 90% of the island's 3,000 residents. After the noise of Athens, Hydra's traffic-free tranquility is a delight. I'm glad I'm packing life as I hike up to my hotel. Hydra is one of the prettiest towns in Greece. Its superb harbor is surrounded by an amphitheater of rocky hills. 
There's an easy blend of workaday commerce, fancy yachts, and lazy tourists on island time. Donkeys rather than cars, the shady awnings of well-worn cafes, and memorable seaside views all combine to make it clear. It is pretty. Your Greek isle. Really hot in the summer. Pedro is a Greek naval town famous for its shipbuilders. The harbor, with twin ports and plenty of cannon, housed and protected the fleet of 130 ships as the Greeks battled the Turks in their early 19th century War of Independence. The town stretches away from the harbor, a maze of narrow cobbled streets flanked by whitewashed homes. In the 1960s, the island became a favorite retreat for artists and writers who still draw inspiration from its idyllic surroundings. One of the island's greatest attractions is its total absence of cars and motorbikes. Instead, donkeys do the heavy hauling today, just as they have through the centuries. Yeah. And I suppose for just as long, they've treated children to rides as well. At the top of the town, the humble Taverna Leonidas has been around so long, it doesn't need a sign. The island's oldest and most traditional taverna was the hangout of the local sponge divers a century ago. These days, Leonidas and Paniota feed guests as if they're family. And tonight, the place is all ours as our enthusiastic cook welcomes us into his kitchen. So what are we cooking? Uh, we'll put uh, lamb, with uh, roast lamb. lamb, cream saints, oh, yeah. with white lemon sauce, calamari with a garlic sauce, very good, uh, spanakopita, spinach pie, spinach pie, egg plant, yeah, and then wheat. And before we know it, Leonidas has us all sitting at the table and he starts bringing in wave after wave of his fabulous dishes. Here we go, the shrimp. Yeah, the shrimp. Very shrimp. Uh, with all lemon sauce. A fleet of taxis shuttle people to outlying hamlets and beaches. We're catching one for a windy survey of the island and to be dropped off for a scenic hike back into town. Idra is popular with walkers who come to explore the network of ancient paths that link the island's outlying settlements, churches, and monasteries. And in springtime, hikes come with fields of wildflowers. A delightful way to cap the day is to follow the coastal path to the village of Kamin. Its pocket-sized harbor shelters the community's fishing boats. Here with a glass of ouzo and today's catch, as the sun slowly sinks into the sea, boats become silhouettes. You drink to the beauties of a Greek island escape. Perhaps nowhere else does the historic and cultural timeline of Europe reach so far back while being so vibrant today. I hope you've enjoyed our look at Athens, the Oracle of Delphi, and the romantic Isle of Idra. I'm Rick Steves. Until next time, keep on traveling. Adios. Thank you, Rick. That was uh, awesome. Interplay between hips and shoulders. <laughs> Capitals grew bigger and bigger to an absurd size when finally they supported entire temples. Folks from Perry to better appreciate the actual historic sites. Are you ready to travel this book? The king gave a balcony from this beach. Oh, no, look at me! <laughs> Matt and Rick, he is just too funny. Um, for tomorrow, we may do this again. We need the points. Yes, yes. Uh, and we need the information. So there. With that, let's pull. Let's see. We are.